So let me just tell you the sort of cases that I imagine, that I'm discussing. They're like thought experiments. Uh, they're like scientific ex experiments done in a laboratory where you can hold all factors constant and alter a variable, just one variable at a time to see the effect. You know, scientists still do that, I assume, right? So uh, uh, the thing is that, of course, you're just imagining, right? So philosophers of my stripe, analytic moral philosophers, are, spend a lot of time discussing this one case which has been made famous called the trolley problem, okay? So there's a trolley headed towards five people that's going to kill them. And a bystander could turn the trolley onto another track, away from the five, all right? But then, unfortunately, there's a one person on the other track who'll get hit and be killed. And the question is, is it permissible to do that, to turn the trolley? So here's an imaginary case. It's not like I'm there, standing there, okay? There's another variant. There are thousands of variants. These are all like little thought experiments. This is what he means by saying that I think of myself in a case, all right? So the trolley's headed towards the five in this other variant. There's someone standing on a bridge over the trolley tracks. If you push that one person in front of the trolley, it will stop the trolley and save the five people from it. May you do that? Now, many people say, and here the question is, I haven't done surveys. This is another part of the method. You think about it. I think it's permissible to turn the trolley away from the five, though it will hit the one. I do not think it's permissible to push the one person over in front of the trolley, even though, again, one person will die and five people will be saved. So what's the difference? All right, why do I have this intuitive judgment? I make a judgment about right and wrong. And I, this is supposed to be an objectively true judgment, mind you. It's the sort of judgment I think you should agree with and you should agree with and you should agree with. It's not something that's just expressing my own you know, personal point of view, any more than Professor Wilson's, you know, views that you've come to hear are just a way of reaching into his soul and understanding him. He claims to be talking about the truth about the adaptive He's just giving conscious. us a narrative. Right. Now, well, that's the thing. We're not just interested in ourselves, you know, what am I thinking? We want to know whether we're latching on to the truth about the subject matter we're thinking about, and that's the same in ethics, all right? So the thing is that where I agree with Professor Wilson is that, um, I do not think, I think first of all that a lot of people tell themselves stories. They call it confabulation. I would call it conjectures that are not correct. So for example, some psychologists have thought that the only distinction between these two trolley problems I've introduced you to is that in the one place I'm up close and personal to the person I push over the bridge but not the person that I turn the trolley to. Now, the way you deal with a hypothesis like that is you think, well, suppose instead of pushing the person over the bridge, I had a machine that from a distance I could press a button and it would push the person over the bridge. Do I think that makes it permissible to push him over the bridge? And I say intuitively my judgment is no. So when I remove the factor that is presented as the crucial variable between permissible and impermissible, I do not get a change in my judgment about impermissibility, which suggests that this factor is not accounting for my judgment. Now, this is a way, you know, of teasing out whether a particular factor, a conjecture, is correct or incorrect. Similarly, you could do it by taking this factor that people say makes the action impermissible, construct another case where it is present, and find, lo and behold, it doesn't make the action impermissible, which I've done also, which is my, why my case my, you know, I have so many cases. Now, I think that this is like the method that you call access to the adaptive unconscious that is called inference. It doesn't mean that I have privileged access to myself that I couldn't have with someone else because I'm constantly testing, trying out and testing hypotheses about why is it that I have made that judgment, okay? And Professor Wilson grants that you can have access of that sort, inferential. And that's one of the reasons I agree with something else he says, namely that I could have as good knowledge about why someone else makes a certain judgment as about why I do. Because when I see all the people who say, yes, you may turn the trolley this way, but you may not push the man over, if I have explained by this method of inference, considering all different cases, what the crucial factor is, I would predict that they, in fact, would respond to that factor, right? Now, 
That's why I think that there is some level degree of agreement here, but it doesn't mean that this adaptive unconscious is completely inaccessible, and that isn't what he's claiming. The interesting other thing that I found was that very often the so-called confabulations that people give, they tend to be quite simple, like this one, well, you're up close and personal, you're pushing the guy over. My explanation of the difference between all these cases, and not only these two, but many others, you've got to get a theory that accounts for all of them, can be quite complex, or it can seem like something like, what? You know, I would never have thought of that, right? And I was very struck in your book by your, uh, what you called implicit learning. Uh, they flashed certain um, lights uh, or X's, right, in various quadrants of a screen according to a very complicated formula. Implicitly, there was learning to uh, uh, adapt to that flashing of light so that eventually subjects came to predict where the next X would be. If you ask them to verbalize this complicated formula, what made them do... No, they said other things, simple-minded things that didn't correlate at all with the way they behaved. The actual truth was complicated, all right? And so when the theory that I discover, if it's complicated or not, that that's really what's going on, you know, that's really what is causing people to behave in certain ways or respond in certain ways, I take that as, again, consistent with something that Professor Wilson had said. The one thing that I want to emphasize here is that we're not just looking into our navels when we do this as philosophers. When I claim that this is a factor that accounts for why it's permissible to do something in one case, impermissible to do it in another, I'm claiming that that's the truth, moral truth. This is a step beyond investigating intuitive grounds, right? Grounds for intuitions. And that means that it's supposed to be universalizable. That is to say, everybody, no matter how much they differ from me in their likes or dislikes, their upbringing, their interests in life, will have to agree, or should agree, that this is the way they ought to behave, that there's permissible for them to do this and impermissible not to do, the, and impermissible to do the other thing. So there is this claim to objectivity and universality, okay, about permissibility. And that's not just self-knowledge. And my sense is that that's what's really important, to find out that. <laughs>